Hey guys, today we've got a guest on this channel for the first time. Uh, let's welcome Steven Chong. He's a competitive aquascaper who ranked 5th in 2018 in the IAPLC. We'll go into more detail about that. And he ranked 15 in 2019 last year, which is really amazing. And he's a member of the Tokyo Aquascaping Union here in Japan and a pretty new aquarium YouTuber. Uh, so, hi Steven, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and competitive aquascaping, the TAU? Yeah, thanks so much. It's great to be on the channel with you, Ryo. What should I call you, Watanabe-kun? Ryo, I'll call you Ryo. Anything, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Steven Chong. I'm from Hawaii. Um, as Ryo mentioned, I'm a member of the Tokyo Aquascaping Union. Um, it's a competitive aquascaping group. We focus mostly on the IAPLC, or the International Aquatic Planted Tank Layout Contest, uh, okay. which is basically, it's like the World Championships of Aquascaping. Um, it's run by Aqua Design Amano, the company made by Amano Takashi. And next year, 2020, is going to be the 20th anniversary year of the contest. Um, so I competed, I think, six or seven times, but only after entering TAU, which is a team of, you know, small team of highly competitive aquascapers here in Tokyo um, did I really start to see you know advancements in my skill and abilities uh, as Rio mentioned in 2018 I had the honor of ranking fifth which was the first year that Americans ever got into the top seven of the Tokyo I, of the contest I'm American but living in Tokyo and then in last year 2019 again was honored to uh, received rank 15, which is the honor ranks. If you guys don't know, um, well, the aquascaping world in general is a big hobby, but IAPLC has for a long time had over a thousand participants at its peak, like 2,300. I think recently it's been more around 1,900, 1,800, which is about where it was when I um, finally got into the winning ranks. But top 127 is winning, top 27 is honors, and then top seven is, you know, Joey, the upper um, yeah. grand prize through bronze. So TAU is a small team. We have like seven members, three or four active. Almost all of the core active members have uh, been in the top ranks. My teacher, Fukada Takayuki, is one of the only guys, along with Josh Sim, to have two grand prize um, championships. So it is a group of, you know, absolute nerds, like super... Yeah. Super, yeah. super about the contest. That's what we're about. So, um, as Ryo mentioned, recently I started a YouTube channel called Steve Scapes. You can go and check it out later on if you want to learn more about competitive aquascaping. Yep, I'll put that down in the description below. So make sure to check that out. He teaches yeah. about aquascaping and how to improve, right? Right. So... Long story short, you know, I was um, starting to look around aquascaping YouTube and found this guy. Um, and I couldn't tell if he was in Japan or out of Japan because he had these videos about, you know, the types of stores that I think I've been to Aqua Field before. You recently made a video about Yeah, video yeah, about I did. I, I still have one more coming out. Yeah, and so we got in touch and, um, you know, Ryo is really getting into aquascaping now. So we're going to talk about aquascaping today. Yes, so um, let's have a little bit of a Q&A session. Um, so could I, well, first of all, how did you get into aquascaping? Okay, so um, I think this is a pretty, pretty typical story, but I did fish tanks as a little kid. I had a 10 gallon Yeah. and, you know, got out of the hobby as I got older. But then, you know, one day I got this itch to keep Corridor's cats again because they're just so cute. Okay, and, so Corridorus was like the thing that brought you back into the hobby. Right, so I went to a pet store, and it's so ironic because I've never done an aquascape with them in it, right? But I went to a pet store in Kahala called Kahala Petland in Hawaii. Oh yeah, I think I saw um, Aquascaping 101. He, You've he, been before? Hmm? No, no, I've, I've never okay. been, but Aquascaping 101, another a smaller uh -huh. YouTube channel who lives in Hawaii. Like, he made a video about that store, so... Great! Yeah, so, back in the day, um, there was a guy named Robert Lau who was a manager at this store and kept a big planted tank there. It just blew me away. Plants and fish, so healthy. Yeah. And 
I've also always been into painting and drawing. Um, and I was, um, I was a student uh, underneath a landscape painter in Hawaii named Hiroshi Tagami. And, you know, I saw my first aquascape. I was like, this is, it's like landscape painting, but it's also living creatures. And I just love fishing, all yeah. sorts of animals. I was like, I got to do it. And within, you know, within the next month, I had all of Amano-san's books and was like super into it. And was like, this is what I got to do. But to be perfectly frank, you know, um, I'm from that old, well, not old. It's, I think there's like a pre, pre-internet hobby, an early internet hobby, and then, you know, modern internet hobby. And in that early internet hobby phase, uh, where like the community was really on forums, that's yeah. where I'm, like George Farmer and I knew each other when the hobby was just starting up. That's really same, cool. Th same thing with Philippe from Portugal. Yeah. And, um, you know, eight aqua, Aquatic Plant Central, PlantedTank.net, um, those were like our hangouts where I pretty much learned to not kill plants and fish in a glass box. And <laughs> before, and you know, the basics of uh, skills that you need to be in the hobby. But I really never got good at the design aspect of it until um, like 10 years later, I'd moved to Tokyo, um, was working in marketing here. And then, um, you know, I figured since I'm in Japan, I should get um, in touch with the community. And then some aquascapers told me, you should meet up with the Tokyo Aquascaping Union. Those guys are crazy. And it turns out that we were both just the right amount of crazy. That yeah. I, got, <laughs> I got on board. They told me, you can't be in a 60 centimeter or 45 anymore if you want. It's like, if you're with us, you got to aim for the top. We got, and you got to go big and, um, and so throwing, throw, throwing concerns to the wind, diving in, basic training, intensive training, did what I could. And then um, three years later, finally got um, into, you know, finally got, in, got into those upper ranks. But, you know, it's a starting line because we, it's, I still have to challenge Karasan and Josh. I still have yeah. to challenge those yeah. top guys. What is something that competitive aquascapers do that like regular fish keepers, aquarists, don't think about? Okay, good. Good question. So um, I think most people have goals for a lot of the things they do, right? But I think especially when we're in a hobby, when we're doing something casually, sometimes we don't make goals for ourselves. We don't think about what things we want to achieve. But to be good at anything, you have to set goals. Um, and the same goes with competitive aquascaping, especially because it is a competition. You're in it to win. And what that means is the biggest difference between having a glass box in your house to enjoy and doing it to compete is that there's a deadline. Uh, there's a definitive endpoint of when you have to be ready, right? Which, and aiming towards that deadline, you have a resource called time. Um, because it is an annual contest going on every year, um, you have that one year of allotted time as a resource, right? But if there, I mean, to grow a typical planted tank, if you have water in the tank for three months, you're good, right? You can yeah. get any plant to where you want it to be, pretty, beautiful, etc. But if a resource can be used, it will be used. And so for the top, top aquascapers, that resource of a year, use the entire year or even use more than the year if you can. And um, how you use that year, in other words, your project management skills actually come into this. Like how you are able to use that year affects how you, um, how you do. Because I think like, you know, the typical... So like in the basic overall process, there's thinking about what you want to do as a first step, then hardscaping, right? Then uh, planting, and then you fill the tank and you grow your plants. When do you put your fish in? And then when do you photograph, right? I think the typical casual entry to the IAPLC or like, if they do enter like the IAPLC or AGA, um, the Aquatic Garden Association contest, which is a little bit more casual. But if People who enter it without thinking too much, maybe they'll spend a day or two 
thinking about what they want to put in the tank, or maybe not even at all, right? They just start grabbing rocks and wood and moving things around until they're ready. And they might hardscape for a few hours or a day, I don't know, before planting plants and then filling the tank. And then three months or five months, or you know, maybe the tank is filled with water the entire year and they're taking care of their fish and their plants, right? Yeah. It's great. Honestly, any tank that has healthy fish and healthy plants beautiful right but i mean in a competition there's all sorts of skill and technique that can be used and the full asset of a year so a competitive aquascaper who's focused on the georama style na is a little bit different you know the traditional amano style and we could get into how different but like for a georama layer layouter who wants to make a high impact aquascape the kind that josh sim does or scott Asan or i would aim for um you're going to take eight months or 10 months if you can go even if you could take time from even the previous year but like six eight ten months to think about what you want to make in the aquascape like looking through photos studying um drawing drawings or simulating and then you come to an idea and then even after that six to eight months of you know image study and like study of other layouts for ideas then, you know, maybe take three months to do the hardscape. <laughs> like you're in there, the dry tank, but you've got your rocks and your glue and your cigarette butts or whatever it is that you're using. Um, and you're putting the pieces together and you finally, you know, reach the hardscape image that you want. And something that we like to say in TAU is never, I mean, Whenever you make an aquascape, you have to expect what it'll look like with plants, but never rely on the plants to do a task that can be done in the hardscape stage. So make sure you pour all the energy that can be poured into the hardscape stage. And then, you know, I might take one or two weeks to plant the plants as I want them, um, fill the tank, and then if I can get three months to grow the tank, that would be great, right? But sometimes you don't even get that far. Sometimes you only get two months or two and a half months. But um, the biggest time investment is coming to the idea. Um, then the next time investment is hardscape. And those are the two most important. And then after that, what do you do in the planting and filling stages? Um, and that when someone who's approaching it that way versus more casually, the result is going to be totally different, I think. I think a similar mentality can be taken to more casual tanks. It doesn't, it's not... A requisite that you spend half a year thinking about it right but if you have a goal in mind like when whenever we start working on a layout we ask like forgot san will ask me or i'll ask um some someone else like takai san i'll say well first what's your goal and then that's usually a number you know are you aiming to reach top 127 top 27 top seven grand prize so what's the number? And then the sec second question is, uh, what is it that you're trying to express? So is it a tree? Is it um, a tree that's fallen into a river? Is it a forest? Is it a mountain? Um, so like those two pieces, uh, what your goal and then what the story is, then everything else gets dictated by that. Um, even in the same way, like if I would approach uh, like, an aquarium that was going to be at a trade show or an aquarium that was going to be in someone's house, it started off with the goal, right? Um, in the case of the IPLC, people are only seeing that one photo. Nothing else matters. So yeah. all your planning goes into that. But if you're talking about a tank that's going to be seen from different angles, that becomes part of the goal, right? Uh, part of the define, define the goal is how does it look from this side, this side, this side? what kind of people are going to be looking at it. Maybe if little kids are going to be there, it's a better idea to use honey gouramis than something that's really badass looking. <laughs> right? So what do you want the audience to come away from it is the mentality you need to take into aquascaping um, or any art really. And if you take that approach, if you make that step, then... Um, you're going to come closer to where you wanted um, than if you didn't think about it at all. 
So, Yoku, and that's why I wanted to ask you, like, what are your plans for the 60 centimeter, man? My plans, what? Well, or what is your goal for the 60 centimeter? <laughs> like, there's, there's no number right now. It doesn't like, have to be a number. It doesn't have to be a contest tank. But if, if it's not contesting, that's part of the goal, right? Uh, like, my goal is to have a beautiful study tank that will you know, inspire a lot of people who check out the YouTube channel. Yes, my goal, that is kind of my goal. I want to make it as beautiful as I can. Um, I'm still thinking of an image, of a layout. So I want it to be a nature style, kind of like Sumida Aquarium style for that 60cm. But I'm not so sure yet. It might change. And um, my goal for the future is to get more into aquascaping. So... I want to, like my long-term goal, I want to get a 120, do a nice scape and bring that to a contest. Um, but that's, that's something to think about later on. First I gotta, of course, study and keep trying because it's experience, right? Aquascaping. Okay. Yeah, one step at a time, one step at a time. So that's why and I'm no. starting small. Yeah, and any style is... Um, so for guys who don't know, nature aquarium style is like the more traditional um, <clears throat> layouts that were inspired by Amano-san. They're typically pretty basic in terms of hardscape, but I think like Iwagumi is one example or you know, simple woodscapes that are surrounded by stem plants and so forth. But uh, one thing that I would tell the audience is that when you have less elements, you have to be even more you know, create, you have to be even more creative, more insightful to make a big impact. Yeah, right? when I when I first started aquascaping, I started with an Iwagumi 60cm in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just saw pictures on the internet and I just love the simplicity and minimalist style. So I did that and I was quite happy with it. But mm -hmm. I just felt it wasn't enough. Like, I needed more, you know. Mm. So then, and also I had problems with that Iwagumi. Um, I was yeah. using dwarf hair grass, and and then I introduced some Rissia into the uh -huh. tank, and the Rissia somehow got down into the hair grass and just mixing together, and it's impossible to remove all the Rissia. Hey, that's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, my ma my last layout also used Rissia and hair grass. Tribute to Amano-san. Yeah. Um, but actually, to get a really powerful, inspiring Iwagumi is not easy. Um, it takes real skill. And then Ono-san likes to joke to me, you know, Steven, now you're, um, for, you've consistently for two years gotten to the top layouters, but I, I bet I could still kick your ass. <laughs> oh, am I allowed to? Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I bet I could still kick your butt easily at Iwagumi. I'm like, I don't doubt it at all. <laughs> I don't doubt it at all. Um, I think like actually in one of Green Aqua's recent videos, um, Ono-san is interviewed and I kind of translated for him and we're talking about the Iwagumi that Amano-san did in the gallery and how there's like a natural flow of the river yeah. and you, you have to visualize how the water is moving um, in order to get the essence of what Amano-san was expressing in the placements. So I definitely recommend people check that out. Um, actually, as a personal recommendation to beginners, it's so interesting because the hobby is really counterintuitive, I feel. Like, you know, um, you can get a... Beginners want to get a small aquarium because it's a smaller investment, right? But it's actually much easier to keep a bigger tank because if there's more water then it's more stable. I mean, in your case, Rio, you're a veteran um, plant keeper and fish keeper, so 60p, you know, husbandry is not an issue. But for someone with no experience, you know, the bigger tank is the more stable one. Yeah. And in the same way with hardscaping, um, I feel that people want to start off with NA style because it's simpler and it does require less material. Um, rather, you're forced to be more selective and more impactful with less material, right? But I would recommend to beginners that they 
buy a ton of rock and wood if they can and challenge the diorama style, you know, the photorealism recreation style. And the reason I say that is because um, in NA style, you know, it's an intuitive art and there's no absolute correct answer. It's a bit more ambiguous, ambiguous, right? And so if you screw up, it's not as easy to notice. Um, though top layouters will notice. But the thing with like diorama is it either looks photoreal or it doesn't. It either, like I do drawings for most of my aquascapes before I actually put them together. It either looks like the drawing or it doesn't. Mm. And, then, um, and you're looking at your, like for, let me share a screen for a bit, right? So this is, uh, uh, this is one photo comparison from Facebook, but you can see the top one is- Your drawing. Right. The illustration I made in Photoshop yeah. uh, for my rank, World Rank 5 Aquascape. And the middle picture is black and white, but this is the hardscape before the tank has been filled. And then the bottom, well, I changed, I ended up changing the whole foreground concept in the bottom, but you can see between the painting and the hardscape, they're really similar. Yes, yes, right? it does look really similar. Yeah. And actually, you know, my, one of uh, my teacher's critiques for me is, don't follow the drawing so literally because in the process of hardscaping, you should be able to find, um, you know, ways of doing it that's even better than your original drawing. But I think um, having an image of what you want to do and then seeing whether or not you can actually create it um, perfectly, that in itself is a really good exercise for beginners because, again, it's more objective. Um, did you actually create the thing that you wanted to or didn't you? And then it, it, make, it forces you to realize, like, if I'm going to have a mountain that far away, that small, how big is the rock that I actually need? Or inversely, if I'm going to have this huge structure in front or somewhere, often people have rock or wood that's nowhere near big enough. And um, they don't get it until they're comparing to, you know, an objective goal. I want the Iwagumi stone to have this much presence. I want the Father stone to have this much presence and thickness. Well, if you're comparing to an actual picture that you prepared or um, a photo that you compared, you can see yourself, um, you know, on your smartphone, whether or not you picked a rock or a piece of wood that is big enough or small enough. Um, and then that gives you a sense of, what the right size is, what the right angle is. And that sense will also help you a lot when you're doing the more traditional nature aquarium style. So, you know, art is subjective. Art is, you know, um, whether it's good or not, it's a subjective question. Yes, it is a subjective question, but if you treat it as if it's an objective one, you'll do better. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, sometimes people like to joke that it's good to be liberal when you want to see the reality of the world, but conservative if you want to actually do well in your career. Mm. <laughs> like the reality, <laughs> like um, the reality is that art is subject subjective, but you'll do better at it if you treat it as something objective with goals to aim for, with you know rules of design. And um, like in the case of diorama, you either hit the mark or you didn't. What if, um, so you say getting the right materials, right, is important. Is what if some people can't find those materials or are having trouble finding them? This is a very good question. And I love it because people talk about materials for aquascapes on YouTube so much. Um, let me say this. The best material is the one that you can have an unlimited amount of. Okay. It's so interesting because a lot of my friends who do a lot more nature aquarium style, the traditional style, they like to think of, um, you know, they talk a lot about the face of the piece of wood or stone, right? How good is it? How attractive is it? Um, and I really like to take a lot of time to uh, find the you know, the, find the best looking piece of hardscape. 
And I'll do that sometimes, especially if I'm looking for something that I really need for a certain design. But um, honestly, if I had to tell you, um, I'm going to need like, I'm going to need tons of rock and wood to do what I want to do in one of my layouts, right? Because yeah, you have to fill out that entire space, right? Yeah. And so, um, so the lava rock that I had before in that aquascape, let me see, wait. Yeah. So the lava rock that features in this aquascape. Yes. Or this aquascape. Um, or this aquascape. Actually, almost all of my layouts are done with this type of plate lava that I found and sourced myself. But I didn't really spend a whole lot of time looking at individual stones. In some cases, I even just bought big ones, like massive ones, and then smashed them with a hammer and used okay. whatever I got out of it. It, um, it. it is much more important to have the stone that is the right size and the right shape rather than one that looks good. Or it's, in, it's important to have enough small stones that can be pieced together to make something that looks cool. Uh, in other words, the best hardscape is made. It isn't bought. And so if you are going to be spending, uh, or another way I would put it is, it's a lot easier, if you got the same amount of money, it's a lot easier to buy, I mean, to make an, a good aquascape with a hundred pounds of slate, like flat slate, mm. than it is with one with one Hakai stone. Yeah, I so saw. I heard Josh Sim say the same thing with Legos, right? You can't create anything with just four pieces of Legos, but you can. If you have a whole set, then you can do whatever you want. Exactly, exactly. Um, and the other thing that, like. Um, the other thing that my teacher Fukada san likes to say a lot is good material comes to those who look for it. It's the same thing with ideas. Good ideas come to the people who look for them. If you've always got your antenna up thinking about what the next aquascape is going to be, then the odds that you encounter it are much better. Um, I was actually drive. I was on a family trip with my wife and kids and we were driving, we were it's kind of like, you know, in the front seat, looking out the window, checking out the scenery. We were in um, Nagano Prefecture, went to Kamakochi. But on the drive back, I like, I was, stop the car! <laughs> stop the car! And my wife's like, what? We have, there, there's a lot full of rocks back there. We got to go back. <laughs> and that's where I uncovered my aquascaping rocks. I mean, they look a lot like, uh, they look a lot like the Sansui, the ADA cells. And it pretty much is like the same type of rock, but um, mine is a little bit different and it's a lot, lot, lot cheaper because it's from a gardening <laughs> shop out in Nagano Prefecture. Um, and I just bought a ton of it, bulk of it, smashed pieces, did whatever I want. I had uh, the, enough volume to... and enough volume and then the hardscaping skills to do whatever I wanted with it. And then, you know, two, two years later, because the first year I entered with those rocks, I ranked 525. <laughs> so I went from 525, but then the next year ranked five. That's amazing. And yeah, with rocks that I found it. So good materials come to those who look for them. Yeah, um, you have to be creative. Know, exactly. You know, like the roots in Fukada-san's... Um, 2015 grand prize aquascape uh, longing like uh, you know the Malaysian guys they have their really you know nice roots and there's tons of um, really intensive uh, root and wood hardscape um, layouts from Indonesia that's great I really am jealous of those guys but you know what Fukada san uh, was ranked one in the world with a wood and root aquascape that has yet to be topped and that layout's roots are made out of christmas wreaths <laughs> <laughs> like literally you, you get the christmas wreath you boil it and then you, you use a lighter or whatever to shape it into the shape you want and uh, yeah that's what you use <laughs> that's really interesting so 
the best guys, the best material for aquascaping is the one that you can have find an almost unlimited amount of. Um, I mean, even look at Josh Sims layouts, like the wood in his Congo layouts, you know, or um, the wood in any of his aquascapes. Yeah, they're great. But look at the stones. You'll notice that none of the Malaysian layouts have really awesome looking, cool looking stones. If anything, um, all their stones are kind of janky and round and a little, it's not like Monten, you know what I mean? But it doesn't really matter because the stones are just a platform for the woodwork. And, um, and even the wood, even if you don't have like super badass looking wood, you know, Josh just won grand prize last year with that piece of wood. And as he told you in the green aqua videos, that was made, not bought, right? Um, I have a question here about, like, what do you do after the tank has been set up and you've taken the picture, sent it to a, sent it for um, competition? What happens to the tank after that? Do you take it apart and start all over for the next year? Yup. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the fun, man. Uh, in fact, like, okay, um, can I jump back to the material part? Yeah. One more time. Oh, and for all you aquascapers, guys who view Rio from the U.S., don't complain to me about material because actually the wood in my layouts is from Tambar. I just bought I just bought a bunch from China um, when I went there. But I mean, in that world rank five layout, all the wood is from Tambar in, in the U.S. So I hadn't sent it to me in Japan. So I don't want to hear complaints. You you can get stuff if you want. Um, so back to the conversation of the contests. Yeah, in fact, I did three contests last year, not only the IPLC in Japan, but also the IIAC for Taiwan, ISTA, um, international contest that had over 500 participants, and the CIPS, China International Pet Show, um, which is a ch the Chinese international contest, had over 1,000 participants. Oh, I, I mean, I guess the Chinese government doesn't want to release exactly how many, but that means it still wasn't as much as IPLC, right? That's like, it's a good competition between those three as to which is the most important. But I did all three last year, which means I emptied the tank. You know, actually, wait, let me let me do the share screen again. So this is the Aquascape that uh, ranked five for IPLC, and then this was is that Butterfly Hideaway. Yeah, butterfly hideaway, um, because I have rainbow butterfly, uh, Gertrude's butterfly, I believe yeah. is the name of the fish. Love this fish, it's kind of pale skirt, and you can see like they kind of look like butterflies, right? My idea was that. Um, have you ever? Um, I love the reflection I, on the top. Thanks. You mean over here? Yeah. And we actually weren't blow drying either, but yeah, yeah I can tell. One fish, I think, like pecked the surface of the water at some point in the middle of this photo, and then it gave this nice ripple here. And um, none of the other photos I have this tank had that ripple. Like if you look at the version that I sent to the AGA, if you go to the AGA contest, there's no ripple like that. But just this one magical here was perfect long. timing. Yeah. So you just take a, <laughs> that's part of the magic too, right? The day of, you take a whole bunch of photos, you find the one, because you only need the one, right? So this was IPLC 2018, and then IPLC 2019, um, this aquascape entitled Amano Gala. Amano. Um, yeah, Amano's River, though in Japanese means Milky Way. And I wanted to have a convex layout with only Japanese plants that featured um, in this top area, Risia hair grass and Potomagetin gai, which is a three plant combination that Amano-san used in a lot of the layouts in his original um, book, the Nature Aquarium World Series. Uh, I felt like two things that I really felt good about this tank afterwards was hearing people say it reminded them of the original Nature Aquarium World, not like the NA style that ADA uses, and even Amano-san uses modernly, and in the aqua journals, but, you know, real old school is the feel. And then also um, Hiko Blehar, uh, you know, the 
The old man of biotope aquascaping himself said that this felt like a biotope aquascape. I was like, thank you. That's what I was going for. Though Beryllius are not a Japanese fish. This is the Asian hill stream trout from Thailand, um, Beryllius bakeri. And I wanted to do oikawa, which is the Japanese pale chub, but you, they eat plants. <laughs> but, okay, so this was IPLC 2019, ranked 15. And then this was IIAC um, 2019, ranked 34. You can see it's pretty much the same plant and fish as the IAPLC layout, but I took out the biggest piece of stone and I put in wood because, um, so the thing about a great aquascape or a strong composition is what matters is the big pieces, um, how the layout is pieced together, the base of the aquascape. And then if the base is good, you can change the content of the story and it'll still be good. So like you could even go with totally different plants on this hardscape and make a new interesting layout. But in my case, the, the Taiwanese contest and Japanese contest have only a month difference in time. I really didn't have time to make a new layout. So yeah. I just pulled out the big pieces of rock, made it a woodscape and here we go. And then, um, but for the Chinese contest, the CIPS, um, I pulled everything out and made a whole new aquascape. And what, um, one of my friend Ono-san's comments was, isn't this just a repeat of your 2018 layout? And I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. It, it does look similar. It does <laughs> look similar. Have, I wasn't spending half a year thinking about another layout. So yeah. I just kind of um, autopiloted through this. And uh, this hardscape took me two and a half months. And granted, I got the experience of making this one, so I was able to increase my skill a bit. This hardscape I did in one week. <laughs> but, but, but I love that hanging rock in the middle, the cliff. Oh, thank you. Um, I think, so my 2017 rank, aquascape that ranked 525, um, let me see. I, I know I have it on Facebook. That scape has this one weird angled rock that um, my one of my other friends, Dennis Wong. Did you ever meet him? He's in Singapore too. No, I've never met him yet. Yeah, but so Dennis was giving me a lot of... He, he was teasing me endlessly about this rock here. He's like, what is this? <laughs> what is it here for? What does it, it do, right? Um, and also, it's just way too massive for no reason. Yeah. And so ever since then, I've been in escalating battle of making my father's stone bigger and bigger. <laughs> but I think this kind of um, gets to your question. For I think for competitive aquascapers, part of the fun is you know pulling everything out and starting something new. And if that's if that's not something that you're into, you know, then um, well, you could compete in the one and then compete a few years later. Yeah. But, I'd still have to get used to that. Well, if you have a photo of it, then I guess that's enough because you get that memory forever, right? Right? Mm. So, so Scott-san has two... I see, if I had a fish room, if I had more tanks, yeah. then I, I'd love to do what scott -san does, which is he has one 120 yeah. uh, and then one 150, and then he alternates between them as competitive layouts. And so, um, and he says that part of the reason he does that is because in the IPLC, uh, one of the requirements is the ability to, uh, whether or not the aquascape looks like it can be maintained for a long time. But one thing that Fukara-san likes to do in terms of shaping the perception of the world and the judges about him is that he'll maintain the competitive aquascape for the entire next year. <laughs> so while he was creating Mighty Cave on one side to win IPLC 2016, he still had Long Game Grand Prize 2015 in the other tank, like, and he was maintaining it. He's yeah, proving to them that it's maintainable. Yeah, that... Exactly. Even if people are like, whoa, what the heck is that, right? His aquascape is just so intricate and so detailed. 
yeah, well, a, a year later, it's still there. So, so it's good. and actually, one of the great, like, sorry, can I tell us, the greatest thing was in 2000 and um, 2000, 2018. Fukada-san actually sat out 2017 because he got in a car accident and injured one arm. But at the end of 2017, when he came back and he made a new Anubius layout, for 2018, that ranked third in the world. Um, if you rank in the top seven, ADA asks to, you to send a video. Um, and um, Fukada-san made a video where he sat down in front of Mighty Cave, which was his 2016 layout, and started talking. He was like, oh, wait, this is the wrong Aquascape. <laughs> <laughs> and then he switched over to the, to the one that he did for 2018. And, I w and everyone was just laughing because they'd all seen the previous video um, of that Aquascape, right? But I knew in my head, okay, he's making a political message. Look, that layout that you all loved from two years ago, it's still there. <laughs> so anyone can enter competitions, right? Right. The IAPLC, but there are requirements, rules that you have to follow? Uh, not really. I mean... No salt water tanks. Yeah. Um, take one straight on photo. Um, don't Photoshop in plants and fish and stuff. Uh, people ask me what are the rules on editing for the photo, and I'm like, Ev I'm actually photo editing skills are also part of this contest. Um, how the photography and the photo editing is also part, but I think if you're able to do it on the raw file, then it's okay. You know, that's my feeling. If you're able to, you know, change the settings in your raw file to get the result you want, okay, cool. Once you're, like, doing destructive editing, um, not in the raw file, but in Photoshop itself, yeah, then you're, you know, running into iffy territory there. So why participate in aquascaping? Um, you mean the contest? Yes. Or the, the, the hobby in general? The comp both. Well, well the contest. I think in the hobby in general, it's whether you can feel the passion, you know, for art, for, uh, for fish and plants. But I think in our hectic days and concrete jungles these days, just to have a little bit of nature at arm's reach. And it's such an analog space, you know, it's not a digital one. It's getting your hands in the muck and the grime. And the, there, there's something very earthy about it that I think... Like a challenge. Yeah, but... Something that connects you to nature, too, right? And physical yeah. reality. It just, um, it, it's really, it does release stress. I mean, if you let it be the outlet, it can be the outlet. And, like, sitting in front of that, you know, uh, fantasy world that you created, it really is something special. And then, as for why the contest, as opposed to just doing it for fun. I mean, the contest, in my opinion, it's, about well, two things. Um, having something to measure yourself against. In other words, it helps you set goals. It helps you grow, right? Gives you something to aspire to. But the other big reason is for the community because, I mean, it's not easy to get out to the Nature Aquarium party, but like being online and like being part of the contest with everyone else who entered, it's one thing to just see the results every year. It's another to have your photo even if it's on a white page in the back of the book, you know, like ha you were part of it, you shared it. And uh, if you're on Facebook, you post it and like you make lots of friends and people to talk with about the hobby online and you just share part of your adventure, part of your growth and you're sharing a passion. Um, when you do really get into it, it's so funny. I just met Philip for the first time when I went to China uh, if you rank in the top 100 and number one from your country, you can go to do an on-site contest for CIPS, which is really cool. But I just met, met Philippe for the first time, even though we've known each other for 14 years. But it was like, you know, brothers united. Yeah, or like even, you already knew each other. Exactly. Or even people you'd only recently, you only know them through their, their aquascapes. Oh, I remember your layout from 2015. <laughs> and, um... But there's that, and you meet people from Brazil and from France and from 
everywhere. I can't wait to go to um, Hungary and Amsterdam in March for events with Green Aqua and Aquaflora. But every time you meet aquascapers from around the world, it's so funny because they're like the same people you've always known them to be online. They're like, they're, they're just like you, but <laughs> it, aquascaping is an interesting hobby because it, it really does, um, it really does overcome language and culture and all the barriers that we have as people. You're just um, in that same passion for nature and for art. All right, thank you so much to Steve for joining us on this channel today. Really learned a lot and um, I think if you guys enjoy this and you have any questions, comment down below. Um, maybe we can make a more in-depth Q&A videos answering your questions in, a, in another episode of this. Um, so make sure you go follow out Steve. I'll link his channel down in the description below. Steve Scapes, right? That's right. And um, oh, yeah, you know, I had a good time too, Watanabe san, talking about you know the passion that we shared yes, together. Yes, thank you. One day we need to meet each other. This guy is going to Singapore <laughs> where they have all the good stuff before he sets up his 60 cm. So yes, I'm really looking yes. forward to it. My my audience don't know that yet, but I'm going to Singapore. Of course, I'll I'll do a more in-depth video about why, but so I'll be in Singapore for a while. And then when I come back, I'll make sure to escape this tank and make an enjoyable vid video for you. But um, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take it easy. Cover the screen. <laughs> <laughs>